my actual eyesight is there the high drive deep center go 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 we're out of here we're out of here say a player just like they drew it up in hollywood caladros the three two swing and a miss and the autobahn green wave have upset the kingsway dragons and this is it for good the autobahn green wave are back in the final four a gold pile on their side all right ladies and gentlemen welcome to dw broadcasting's coverage of men from our entire crew we'll see you tomorrow have a good one folks Ladies and gentlemen, game three out of four in this weekend's festivities of the 2024 Ralph Shaw is upon us. It's the Bishop Eustis Crusaders and the Cinemates and Pirates, a word for word verbatim rematch from 2023. I'm Dan Wilkins with my producer Jacob Steidler this afternoon. We've got a good game, but you got to remember what happened last year between these two teams. A 10 0 five inning mercy rule, including the Rutgers commit Landon Mack throwing a perfect game. Now, he won't be on the hill this afternoon for Bishop Eustis, so Cinnaminson could get some hits on the board, but it's very obvious that the favor is leaning towards Bishop Eustis. I think everybody can agree with that. Cinnaminson's job, though, is to steal the show. They're playing for a bronze medal, and even if they don't take the gold today, a gold for them would be taking third place after their loss to Audubon yesterday. Bishop Eustis, for the third year in a row, took a devastating loss to, to Kingsway, 3-0 in 2022, 10-9 in 2023, including a six-run comeback, and last night a three-run comeback, including a two-run game-tying double by Dylan Rickards, followed up by a walk-off bunt by the next batter, Zach Bragg, to give Kingsway a big 4-3 win. And for the third year in a row, they are slated to play Audubon in the 27th annual Ralph Shaw Championship. For Cinnaminson, Charlie Kind is the starter on the hill for them this afternoon. He'll be followed up by Bishop Eustace's um, pitcher, Lucas Edwards. He's going to be on the hill. Landon Mack is in the order, but he is batting third at first base. So everything is pretty similar to yesterday. The same starting nine are in the order for Bishop Eustace and for Cinnamons, and it's all the same except Gideon Crisp is at the DH spot and Anthony Allison Droney is at first base instead of where he was yesterday. And, um, you know, and Smith is going to be down at third at the hot corner tonight. So uh, some very minimal changes are being made, and that's really all there's been. So we're going to take a quick break. Cinnamons and Eustace talking around their dugouts. They're going to take the field in just a moment, and we'll have the consolation third place game for the Ralph Shaw coming up after this.
Cinemits and brings another lefty back on the hill in game two of their Ralph Shaw quest. This is, like we said, the exact same consolation and championship from last year. Same four teams, same first day results, and now we should see if there's going to be the same game two results as well. On the hill for Cinemits in this afternoon is the Southpaw Charlie Kine. He's a junior lefty with a 3.82 career ERA and 11 innings last year, his rookie season with the Pirates. Bishop Eustace will be trotting out the exact same starting lineup as yesterday. Kristen Mishuli is in center field batting leadoff. His brother Anthony takes the shortstop spot batting second. The Rutgers commit Landon Mack is at first base batting third. Trey Martin is the DH at the cleanup spot. Dante Bell at third base batting fifth. Max Sullivan is the second baseman batting sixth. Franco Iannone right fielder batting seventh. Anthony Kay the backstop in the eighth spot and Dante Matarace in the left field position batting ninth. So here we go. Today is a good day for a good day. Game six and seven out of the seven total we are covering this weekend. It's been an action-packed South Jersey bonanza. And now it all comes to a close with these final two games of the Ralph Shaw. First pitch from Charlie Kind is down, and we are underway in Audubon. The Mashuli brothers combined for two hits in the one and two spots in the order in game one, a game that they lost 4-3 versus Kingsway on a walk-off bunt by underclassman Zach Bragg. Fastball doesn't hit, and it's 3-0. You, you just don't want to give up a four-pitch walk on the first at-bat of the game. Doesn't set a good tone. Pumps a fastball right down the pipe. Three and one. I mean, the the velocity difference is phenomenal. You know, he's probably hitting high 70s, maybe like 80 or 81 at best. And you had Landon Mack who hit 94. That was his official top velocity yesterday in his three inning start versus Kingsway. Had eight strikeouts in th three innings. And as we said from the perfect game video behind the plate, he had 94 as his top velocity. It's a fly ball by Mashuli, left field line. That ball is fair. It goes into the corner towards the 320 sign. Coming around and pumping on the brakes at second base for a leadoff double is Mashuli. And Eustace is in business here on the first at bat of the game. First pitch, popped up bunt, first base side, and that will trickle foul towards Hamill down the first base line. A lot more beautiful of a day than it was yesterday. It was cold and windy and miserable yesterday. We had a couple of raindrops here and there, but we've got a nice mix of cloud and sun. It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon here. And probably the best weather we've had all weekend here in Audubon, the 0-1 to Anthony Mashuli, the shortstop. Infield playing in, a fly ball popped up shallow center. McCloskey catches it. Runner does not go, and that'll be the first out. And you might need to have that fastball working well to play to your advantage. You know, I, I think Charlie Kine knows that his fastball is not as speedy as some of the other competition that Bishop Buses faces in the uh, elite Olympic conference. You know, Charlie Kine's fastball, it's good, but it is not as effective versus a team like Eustace as it would be versus a team like, you know, uh, Bordentown or Del Ran that is used to seeing that as more of a median fastball. So Bishop Eustace though, look, they've seen what Kingsway can do and, you know, they're gonna trot out the same lineup as they did yesterday and they're gonna see if they can pounce on Cinnamon's in here early as they did this time last year, a 10-0 five-inning game, the 0-1. To Landon Mack, batting from the right side, he had a two-run home run in the fifth inning of the first round game. It was a shot to right 331 feet. 
and that was from the left side of the dish. So a switch hitting 95 mile per hour throw and laser in the right center field. A nice stop there from Kulik. He gets to throw in. It's an RBI single for Landed Mack. One nothing, Crusaders. And they get off to an early start here with one out in the first. I think Cinnaminson's game plan here is going to be, you know, you're going to give up a couple hits here and there. And you might give up a couple runs, but you want to keep that collateral to a minimum. And you got to think of a way to, you know, kind of counterattack, if you will. Think of it like a mirrored offense. Anything you can do, I can do better. If you could score one run, I can score two. If you could score two, I could score three. You know, you got to just, you have to take it inning by inning. You can't really think about the fact that this is a seven inning game. You have to think about winning the inning. Think about the Savannah Bananas and the fact that they have this whole unique system where if you score more runs than, than another uh, team in an inning, you win the inning. That's the way they call it, banana ball land. So think of it here. Popped up high in the air by Martin. McCloskey calls for it, he makes the catch. Two down. So he holds Mac at first. Now here's Dante Bell. Steps off. Runner goes, throw down to second base, not in time. Stolen base for Mac. He made the move. He got in there safely. It's 0 1. High drive in the right, and Kulik makes the catch. Side retired. Bishop Eustis gets one, but Charlie Kind holds them to just that. Now Cinnamonson gets their first three up in the bottom half of the first right after this. Bottom of the first, here's how, here's how Cinnaminson lines up under head coach Eric Teasdale here in the consolation third place game of the Ralph Shaw. 
Your first three is the same as yesterday. Richmond commit Noah Harvey, Matt Kulik in right field, and Matt McCloskey in center field. Uh, Anthony Allison Droney takes the cleanup spot again at first base. Gideon Crisp is the DH in the five spot. Charlie Kind is pitching but will not bat. And seven, eight, and nine for Cinemitz, and that'll be Logan Hamill behind the plate. Tim Morell in left field in the uh, eight spot. And then in the nine is going to be uh, number 12, Maurice Smith. Dan Stavalone plays second base. I'm not, there was no distinction made on the lineup card whether, because they have 10 guys hitting, but you, you can only have nine. So I think somebody's going to be DHing and then there's going to be a fielding only kind of, uh, kind of position, but I'm not sure who that applies to yet. So we'll just have to keep an eye on it as Harvey down in the count 0-2 with a tapper foul. Versus the pitcher Lucas Edwards for Bishop Eustis this afternoon. Six foot three, 195, lanky right-hander, 1.62 ERA in his career. 4.1 innings pitched, one earned run, four walks and six strikeouts and a small sample size. So it looks like this will be his first full season as Harvey pops this one up. Back behind the plate, going over is K, and it ends up going out of play. You don't see that very often in Audubon just because of how tall the netting is. It usually catches a lot of those foul balls on their way up. But if you hit it straight up and it just ends up getting carried a little bit, it works in Cinnamonson's favor. But it's 0-2 it's to Harvey who drove in two of Cinnamonson's three runs in their first round loss to Audubon yesterday, 9-3. He had an RBI triple in the top of the sixth inning to get Cinnamonson back on the board, and ooh, tough call on the inside corner, and Harvey not happy with it. He goes down on strikes, one away. That's just one of those calls where it's really reliant on the break of that looked like a cut fastball or something like that, but it ran inside and then kind of came back in. If that ball didn't run inside, there's no way it's a ball or there's no way it's a strike. Excuse me, but a fly ball down the right field line. Iannone looks for it and that's on the Walnut Street foul ball. Six pitches so far for Edwards. He's thrown all of them for strikes. He is set, looks down Mike Kulik, the right fielder, and the pitch. I'll talk about a jinx, that's ball one, his first of the day. Well, if Eustace is gonna keep up their domination on the strikeout, this might be a good place to start as that one misses, two and one. I mean, the wind is still there. It's not as extreme as it was yesterday. We had 30 mile per hour gusts yesterday and it was about 10 degrees cooler. Now the real field's 52 and the gusts are about 10 to 15 miles per hour uh, lighter than they were yesterday. They're still blowing in the same direction. It's blowing north, which means basically it's blowing out means we could see a, an offensive slugfest. But the last time we said that, neither game was a slugfest. So you never know. 2-2. Two -two. Kulik lines it to right. That's a base hit. Fair ball. Iannone fumbles it. And the throw down to second is going to be in time. He got him. Oh, he's safe. Wow. Mike Kulik gets in at second base on a near miracle of a play. And Eustace wants an explanation because that, that throw most certainly beat him. And I think he was out too. But they are not going to contest the call any further. They don't want to get each other in hot water. I think he just got under, under the tag. Now this brings up Cinnamonson's three hitter and home run leader from last year, Matt McCloskey, the six foot four unit of a right-handed hitter in center field. That one's outside. I mean, a center fielder batting third, you know, that's a that's a real luxury to have. 
you know, you need to have somebody who's got a good speed tool and also has a good power tool. Because center fielder, that's reserved for your Tyler Wiltses and for, in this case, your Christian Mishulis. But, you know, you also have to think about the fact that when these guys are playing out there, the center fielder almost always bats leadoff. Or if not, maybe in the eight or nine spot. They're usually the bookends of the order. But in this situation, you know, it's, it's good to have a little bit of both. Cinnamonson's dugout is loving it. And you know, what did I say? It's a mirrored offense. You're not facing Landon Mack like you did last year. You're facing a pitcher who has five career high school innings under his belt and hasn't really faced this team before. So it might be something where you're just going to try to explore all your options and see what you got. McCloskey grounds it back to the mound. Kulik, after getting a glance back at second, holds up there. There's two away. Quick mound visit between pitcher and catcher here. Cinnaminson's got a runner in scoring position. They left a runner on second base or third, four out of their seven innings yesterday. They really just had a lot of trouble with leaving runners on base. And, you know, Audubon won that game 9 3, but you imagine it would have been a one or two run game if Cinnaminson strung a couple more hits together even if it's just one or two. You know, there's a situation where two outs, somebody pops out the center field. Well, what if that's a base hit? You drive in two runs, it's 9-5. You drive in another two, it's 9-7. It only takes a couple of swings for a game to turn on its head drastically. And your situation is way different. There's a foul ball by Anthony Allison Droney, the cleanup hitter for Cinnamons and here in the consolation game. No balls, one strike. Edwards steps off. He stepped off and he was gonna throw back to second, but nobody was even covering the bag. They're playing straight up right now. They're not, you know, uh, Anthony Mishuli and Max Sullivan. They are playing as far away from the bag as possible, playing on the outside edge of the infield. Just got to make sure all bases are covered. You know, you're not worried about the runner at second right now because he's not really the biggest part of your collateral. The biggest part of your collateral is the batter. You want to make sure you take care of the primary task at hand. The 0 1. Oh, he stepped off. Cinnamonson wanted a balk called, but I think time was called first. So that's all negated. strike on the outside corner. Got a good zippy fastball there, and it's 0-2. Brant at 14 pitches this frame. Charlie Kind had 16 in his first, where he gave up just that one run on the RBI single by Landon Mack. Here's the 0-2. He got him. Got him looking. And two of his strikeouts in this frame have gone of that variety. Sidiminson once again runs into the scoring position demon. They leave a runner on second base and the Pirates trail 1-0 after one.
Cinnamon's and on the hill and the entire Audubon team in attendance here. Their game is at three o'clock. Kingsway and Audubon in the Ralph Shaw Championship game, a three-time repeat. Same game as 2023, same game as 2022. The only difference was is that in the first round, I mean, look, the only difference between 2022 and now was that it wasn't Cinnamon's and it was another team in black and red, Kings Christian. The last year that John Scanzano was head coaching there. There's a ground ball to third, throw is a little wide. He falls down and he snow cones it in his glove. So a nice 5-3 ground out and a nice scoop by Allison Droney on the snow cone. Like we said, it's a lot more, uh, lot more fair out there tonight. Gonna be about 58 at its high, which will probably be reached probably be reached around the middle of the championship game. So maybe I could use a snow cone if they've uh, got that machine coming around. Ground ball, foul ball by the lefty. 0 and 2. I was going to say, Mr. Softy should be coming around here today, not, not yesterday. It didn't really seem uh, like the right time to bring Mr. Softy to a baseball game, and it was like 45. Now that it's like 55, not that windy, I think you can enjoy a good Oreo milkshake. 0-2. Oh, Swing. He shakes that one up, and he's got a strikeout. Two down. So a quick two outs by Eustace's middle half, and it's going to be Sullivan, Iannone down in order. Here's the catcher, Anthony Kay. I mean, like we said, this is the exact same lineup from yesterday. The only difference is, is that Edwards is not in the order because he's the pitcher. He was the backup for Trey Martin as the DH. And landed Mack moving from the pitcher's mound to first base. I mean, how versatile of a player can you be? Switch hitter, throws 95, committed to a Big Ten baseball, and along with that, you could also say that he um, can play anywhere in the field. I think he played in the outfield last year, too. I think he was in left or right field. He was somewhere there. But he's been all over the place, and it's a good kind of all over the place. One, two, swing and a miss. Oh, Dom had the count wrong on the scoreboard. <laughs> so now it's a two-strike count to Anthony Kay. This time I can say it's not my fault. There's a ground ball foul. Charlie Kind with one strikeout so far. Smoothing, uh, or sailing smoothly for Cinnaminson here in the second frame. One ball, two strikes, two outs. Charlie Kind with pitch number 28. Floated out towards right, Kulik going in, and he makes the catch. Side is retired. Bishop Eustace goes down in order. Cinnaminson has a chance for a remedy here in the bottom of the second. We're one and a half through here in Audubon. One nothing visitors.
Bottom of the second inning, Cinnaminson trails 1-0 to Bishop Eustace here in the third place game of the Ralph Shaw Tournament. Eustace will have 9-1-2 and two in their third inning. But for now, the task at hand is Cinnaminson getting a run on the board. They left a runner on second in the first and are now looking to make up for that with the middle of their order. Gideon Crisp, the DH. One and one. Two and one. Don't forget, folks, tomorrow, not weather depending, but eclipse depending, we've got Woodstown and Pennsville in some Tri County Diamond Division games. That's a four o'clock start, but because the window of the eclipse is right around 4.30, or it should be ending around 4.30. The game might start later than expected. I'll tell you though, it's, it's gonna be chaos when the eclipse actually happens as that one's a foul ball down the right field line and foul. Because the eclipse is gonna happen around, I mean, this is, this is the dilemma that some schools are going through. Penn Salkin has already said that they will have a half day on Monday. And for Audubon, they get out around 2.30. Well, the solar eclipse is gonna start around 2.10. So it's gonna line right up with the time that school gets out. So some people are playing it safe. Lenape is playing Shawnee that day and they have already moved the game back to 4.45. And I, and I talked to Coach Matt Woods last night. I said, do you have lights to field? They said, no, we just really gotta hope that the game moves quickly. Because you're gonna be starting about an hour behind schedule. As the payoff pitch to Crisp is strikeout number three. And there's one away. Foul back by Logan Hamill, 0 and 1. That one is a half swing back to the mound, and Mack takes it in. Two away. It'll be a 1 3 ground out. It didn't even look like it or it didn't even sound like it hit the bat. It didn't make the sound that a usual aluminum bat or a BB core bat makes. Just sounded like it hit the catcher's glove, so. That was funky, but there's two away. Cinnamonson looking to avoid go downing, uh, going down in order in this inning. Here's Tim Morrell. Swing and a miss. Chase that one down and it's 0-2. But for the rest of the week, Tuesday on the 9th, we're holding a fan vote for which game we want to cover. The four options are Seneca and Cinnaminson, Lower Cape May and Absagami, GCIT and Clearview, and the other one, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Uh, Haddon Heights and Paulsboro. So make sure you vote for your choice on our Instagram at DW Broadcasting. But the side is retired. Cinnaminson goes down in order, leaving nobody on. After two, one nothing in favor of the Crusaders.
Here in the third, Charlie Kine still wheeling, and, still wheeling and dealing. Bishop Eustace up by one with Dante Matarese, nine, one, and two. Due up for the visitors and the Crusaders in the third. Matarese and the Mashuli brothers are the ones on deck and slated the bat here in the third. There is a strike. One and one. Charlie Kind at 37 pitches here early in the third inning. Tapped back towards the mound, but it goes out to second. Stavalone throws to first. Not in time. They call him safe. Looks like he just beat it by a step. And I don't know if there's much you can do there. I think the thing is, is that they just tried to work around the ball and they didn't go straight to it, try to get a better angle, but that'll be an infield single. So this turns over to the top of the order for Christian Mashuli. Mashuli, the leadoff man, got a double down the left field line, showed bunt very quickly and now pulls back. It's 0 1. Time is called. No balls, one strike. Runner goes. Throw down to second. This could this could have a chance. He is not in time. And Matarace gets a stolen base. Works his way down to second. It's a little bit refreshing to see a guy like Charlie Kind, you know, working his working his magic well versus Bishop Eustace because, you know, obviously with the news yesterday of uh, Yuri Perez of the Marlins being out for the season, with Tommy John surgery, Steven Strasburg retiring. I mean, Steven Strasburg got a two hundred and forty million dollar contract, and over the next five years, only threw five hundred and forty pitches in the major leagues. Technically, if you look at his contract numbers, he earned $469,000 for every, for every pitch he threw. Wish I could make that kind of money. And Spencer Strider of the Braves on the injured list with a sprained UCL, and it could be more extensive damage because he's getting an MRI on it. You know, like Landon Mack throwing 94 as a high schooler is great. You know, it's, it's great for the high school level. But you also have to consider that you know, the way these pitchers are, are taught to develop, that if you're not throwing upper 90s, you're not worth anything to a professional team. You know, what happened to the Bronson Arroyos? What happened to the Jamie Moyers? You know, I remember 2012, I think it was, his last season that he played Major League Baseball, his fastball sat around 79 to 81. There's some high school pitchers who couldn't cut varsity if they threw 81 miles per hour. But he was 49 years old, playing in like his 23rd, 24th season. And versus Arizona, he threw like seven shutout innings. And don't forget, he was also a World Series champion in 08 with the Phillies. Even then, he was like, what, 45, 46? He didn't throw any, he didn't throw any higher than like 84. And that's why guys like Kevin Gossman, as that's a four-pitch walk. You know, if you look at Toronto's roster, Kevin Gossman is so valuable to them because he doesn't throw higher than 93. But people consider him one of the best pitchers in the American League. You know, even when he was uh, in San Francisco or when he was in Baltimore, you know, he was he was a young hotshot then. And now he's experienced and he didn't gain his velocity any, but he still retains that same dominance at the top of the rotation for Toronto. I mean, Sixto Sanchez, another example with the Marlins, another guy that's just had injuries again and again and again. And he throws like 96, 97. He, like this uh, opening weekend for Miami was the first time that he had a start since like October of 2020. You know, that's three full seasons where you're in and out of injury and you're just riddled on the on the injured list. It's 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 sad to see for the development of, of these baseball players. You know, I, I've seen 50, 60 games every year at the high school level. I see varying fastballs, I see varying curveballs, but I like to see a pitcher that 
can throw the best he can, but doesn't throw hard enough to where he's going to have a UCL exploding. Wild pitch, and Madurais gets the third. One out and a 3-1 count to Anthony Mashuli. It's landed Mac on deck. Strike two. You can say Ross Ollendorf was another example of that. Travis Wood. Heck, if you want a Philly example, Aaron Nola. You know, his windup is very stressful on the elbow. Fly ball right center field. McCloskey's going back, calls for it. He's got it. Matarays tags. He will score. And Mashuli gets down to third. So there's two outs, and it's a 2 0 Bishop Eustace game on a sack fly. So Landon Mack gets the job done. Now it turns over to Trey Martin. So Charlie Kind is out after 44 pitches, and here in the third, we've got a pitching change here in here in Audubon. And Sinemitz and Trails 2-0 on an RBI single and a sack fly. It's been very spread out, but we'll go to break as Michael Beers takes the hill. New pitcher for Cinnamons and Michael Beers on the hill. So Beers for batter will be Trey Martin. First pitch from Beer, or Beers, plural, I guess. <laughs> Downstairs, 1-0. Beautiful scenery this afternoon here from Audubon. It's one and one from Beers. But as we were talking about, Aaron Nola kind of follows that same philosophy. And, and one of the things I heard from the folks that I've talked to is that, yes, Nola's delivery is dangerous for like a high schooler to try to replicate. But at the same time, Nola really only throws like 93, 94. That's his maximum. He's not throwing in the upper 90s towards 100. So yes, that 
UCL is going to blow at some point, but it's going to take longer because he's, you know, taking care of it more. I mean, people want to people want to stress about you know arm care and making sure that every pitcher is conditioned to the best that they can be. But the fact of the matter is, is that throwing like 100 miles per hour is not natural for the human body. I mean, nothing in a baseball motion is. So the higher you throw it, the higher chance it is that you're going to have some elbow issues and you're going to have arm issues. So it's a philosophy of the game that's been changing very drastically over the past 10, 15 years, where it's become less about break and more about just full, you know, unfiltered speed. There's a foul ball down the right field line, goes just past the grandstands. Three balls, two strikes, Cinemitz, and still trails by two. Bishop Eustace got another run on a sacrifice fly to center by Landon Mack, the Rutgers commit. And the payoff to the cleanup man and DH Trey Martin with a runner on third. Time is called. Ball four. And Eustace as their rally staying alive here in the top of the third. So here's Dante Bell. First pitch from Beers, and time is called. Game's running a lot slower than it was yesterday. I felt like there was a lot more energy in the building. I mean, you know, usually there's people lined up around the outfield to watch. The grandstands are mostly full, but it's a bit of a different experience being in the outfield than it is behind the plate. You know, you hear the music so much better uh, from Wade Geis's playlist. Um, you know, you, you hear so many things differently. But there's also downsides to it as a broadcaster. You know, you don't hear, like if, if somebody, if a coach wants an explanation, you can't hear why the umpire called it the way he did. I'd have to call Dom and see if he heard anything. And I'm not going through that trouble. So, like people ask me, why don't you, why do you set up in the outfield? I mean, it looks more natural for a, for a TV audience. There. Uh, what? That was a live ball the whole time. They had the runner like halfway off of second and then they brought him back. They, they basically just kind of did a, a, a game of chicken, basically, on the bases. Very interesting, but... The runner number 33, Colton Crismond. Makes things a little interesting here. 1-1. One, one. That one is down. Now you've got the runner caught between first and second, and he just goes again and goes down to second base. So. Two runners in scoring position for Eustace, but not a lot of urgency from the Pirates. I mean, you know, it's a uh, look. I mean, you got to try to get that base runner out. You got two outs. You know, you're the underdogs in this game. Pull something, you know, pull a wild card out of the rabbit hat. But this will minimize the damage as Noah Harvey fires a throw over the middle and holds Eustace to one. They leave two on, going to the bottom of the third. Two nothing, Crusaders.
Tommy D's Home Design Center has opened a second location on Creek Road in Belmar. Operating in Philadelphia for over 25 years and now expanding into South Jersey, Tommy D's is the place to go for kitchen cabinets, countertops, and cabinet accessories, heavily discounted compared to big box retailers. Stop in, take a seat, and watch as our experienced kitchen designer makes the kitchen of your dreams right in front of you. Tommy D's is the best in the business for quality kitchen countertops and cabinets that fit all budgets. Call us today at 856-210-9504 or visit the new location in person on the corner of Creek Road and Harding Avenue in Belmar next to the 42 on-ramp. Sorry about that, folks. I don't know how long we lost you for audio. Nobody said anything in the, in the comments. Nobody said anything, so I assumed we were fine. Went away. I'm going to have to look back at the footage and see how long we were out. Okay, we were not lost for long. That's the good thing. We were not lost for long. Only like two or three minutes.
No, I'm good. Alright, we should be back on the audio side. Sorry for the uh, delay there, but just had to get things fixed. Bishop Eustace got a quick first out versus Michael Beers. And some incident in business down by two. Left a runner on second base to retire the side in the third. So after Sullivan was retired, here's Ionone. And while we have a chance, now that, now that the audio appears to be working again, we'll check out the WWE trivia time just a moment after this pitch. Yeah, we just had to make sure the, uh, the audio was good. We lost it for a little while. And I don't know what happened, but... We ended up fixing it, and now we know one of our mics is, is, is shot, so uh, that'll be another 75 down the drain, but after this, uh, it's 3-0, so if he gets on base on this pitch, we'll, uh, we'll talk about tribute time. Here's the 3-0 from Beers. Beers. From Beers. To the right fielder, I and own. That one is a strike, three, uh, no, ball four. It's time for DWB Trivia Time. Today's question is, did the Tampa Bay Devil Rays drop the devil part of their name? In which year? Let's see here, we'll bring up the options for you. Uh, the options are 2019, 2008, 2002, and 1999. So we'll reveal the answer in the bottom of the fourth inning. Quick mound visit here for Teasdale and his infield after the walk to I and O. First pitch by K. And it's 0-1. It'll be K and then not a race. Throw back to first, not in time. I mean, hey, hey props, props to Sid and Minson. They have kept, they have kept used to Sid Bay for most of the game. And barring some sort of miracle, it looks like this game is going to go the full seven. I mean, you know, look, last year was a 10 nothing game. Bishop Eustace and Landon Mack threw a five inning perfect game versus Sid Minson. But things are looking a little different. Sid Minson's got a couple hits together, they've got some runners on. They've been treating themselves well. And they've been hanging a lot more even than they did earlier in, uh, in, in last year's festivities. One-one, swing and miss. 
throw down to second is going to beat him, but the throw skips, skips off of his glove, takes a weird carom, and skips in the right center field. Harvey's going to hang on to it, and the runner will stay. Two balls, one strike, and a runner on second. Um, just a slight delay there, but... I own on second. He's the lone useless runner here in the fourth. Two balls, two strikes, and one out after the foul ball. Two balls, two strikes, and the pitch. That's a driller in the back. And K gets on base. So Eustis with traffic on. Two on, one out, and a two-run game here in the fourth. Cinnaminson does have an arm warming up in the pen. And his number 11, Andrew Mosey. He threw four innings last year in a small sample size for the Pirates. Now he'll face the lefty Matarace with the runners on first and second and one away. Line shot. shot. In the right field is a base hit. I know he's going to round third. Kulik's going to slide to pick that one up, but the ball gets away from him. Rounding second and holding there. Matarace is there. And face playing in the home. It's a two-run double for Dante Matarace, and it's 4 nothing. For the freshman, Matarace gets in there and drills one down, down the right field line. Bring home two. And that could be one of those kind of hits that really changes the tide and changes the course of the game. You know, if Eustis can get this kind of production from the bottom of the order, excuse me, from the bottom of the order, and if they continue to chip into the sentiments and bullpen, you know, they know Eustis has a bit of a, a deeper staff just in terms of depth than sentiments and does. So if you have to force them to put in their third or fourth priority guy, then you might be able to get a couple more runs off of them and put this game out of reach. One, two. Curveball, strike three. And Beers gets the strikeout, two down. And it comes at the hands at the top of the order. So Mashuli is retired, and here is Anthony Mashuli. Michael Beers up to 27 pitches in this outing as there's a line drive foul. And look out, Walnut.
One and one the count. You know, we were talking about earlier the, uh, the pitching development and the rise of UCL injuries and Tommy John surgeries. And that'll have to wait, though, as Harvey throws the first. And he is safe at first, infield single for Mishuli. That brings up Landon Mack now. He will bat for the left side versus the righty Beers. But this was a, um, a quote from Dr. James Andrews, who said, I started the following injury patterns and injury rates in the year 2000. Back in those days, I did about eight or nine Tommy Johns per year in high school aged and younger. The large majority of Tommy Johns were at the major league level, then at the minor leagues, and then the college level, and just a handful of high school kids. In today's situation, the whole thing is flip-flop. The largest number is youth baseball. They've surpassed what's being done in the major leagues. That's a terrible situation. So just an interesting quote from what we were talking about back in the third of, you know, the development of pitchers and the kind of uh, arm injuries we're seeing, not just at major league baseball, but at all levels of the game. Just an interesting uh, aspect of it. Michael Beers has been taken out of the game, and Andrew Mosey will be the new pitcher for Sidemanson here in the top of the fourth. A two spot for the Crusaders, give them a 4 0 lead. We'll be right back after this. Still in the top of the fourth, Cinnaminson is one out away from getting out of the inning with two runs allowed, but they've got to get through the middle of Eustace's order first, and the same man who had a two-run home run in the 4-3 loss to Kingsway yesterday, now hitting from the right side, Landon Mack. Now, when he hit that home run in the fifth last night, that was from the left side, and he did grab the bat and go to the left side of the plate, and then Eric Teasdale decided that he didn't want a part of that, and he brought in a lefty. First pitch hits Mack, right in the ankle. That's gonna load the bases. So here's Trey Martin. First pitch from Mosey is outside. 1 0. There's a fly ball out to center field by Trey Martin. It's way up there. McCloskey calls for it and he makes the catch. A big jam avoided and a big crisis avoided as sentiments and allows only two, but that could have been much worse. It's four nothing going to the bottom of the.
Matt McCluskey leading us off in the bottom of the fourth. It is time to reveal the answer of today's DWB Trivia Time. After this first pitch, though, from the new pitcher, Lucas, actually, no, I'm sorry, Lucas Edwards is still on the hill, working in his fourth inning, but on the first pitch, rocketed to right center field, and it is caught in a near collision in right center field. Crisis is averted, though, and it's one away. All right, it's time for today's DWB Trivia Time answer. Today's question was, Tampa Bay Raves, formerly known as the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, dropped the devil part of their name in which year? Was it A, 2019, B, 2008, C, 2002, or D, 1990, uh, 1999? And the answer is B, 2008. The same year that they made the World Series and lost to the Phillies was the first year that they had a new color scheme uh, that did not have the purple and all the other fancy colors on it instead went to a straight uh, navy blue and baby blue scheme in 08. The same scheme that they've held ever since. Two down. So here's Allison Droney. One and one. Don't forget to stay tuned for the Ralph Shaw Championship game between Kingsway and Audubon. That's a three o'clock start. Two and one. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. Cinnamonson still looking to erase the goose egg on the scoreboard. Ground ball foul. Count is full. To Allison Droney with Gideon Crisp on deck for Cinnamon in a 4 0 game in favor of Eustace. Here's the pitch. Brown ball back up the middle. This one's out towards Mashuli. Throw to first is in time. A nice play to take care of business. And the side is retired. We're through four here in Audubon. Eustace is up by four. Tommy D's Home Design Center. Garden State Pet Center is an independently owned full service pet store. Our specialty is promoting companionship between people and animals by providing the healthiest product choices available, including all natural foods, supplements that support and relieve health issues, and innovative products for pet parents. Our goal is to provide our customers with a relaxing environment, and while we're not striving to be the biggest store on the East Coast, we're striving to be the best. No other pet store will make you feel at home like we do. At Garden State Pet Center, we view pets as members of the family. We don't believe in fast, high pressure sales but instead matching up the right pet with the right owners as you are making a lifelong commitment. Together with our team members, we would like your visit to our store to be both enjoyable and educational. Simply drop in and take a look around. View the birds, reptiles, small animals, toys, food, cages, and miscellaneous items. Learn of the services we have to offer and decide for yourself if this is the store you'd like to call your home away from home. Victor Santucci, owner of Garden State Pet Center. Visit us today at 226 South Whitehorse Pike in Audubon, New Jersey. We're open seven days a week for all of your pets needs.
Garden State Pet Center is an independently owned, full-service pet store. Our specialty is promoting companionship between people and animals. Garden State Pet Center is an
Two and one the count. There's a rocket to right field. Wow. Oh, look out. Three balls, two strikes. So yeah, top of the top of the uh, I'm sorry, bottom of the fifth ended a little controversially with an aggressive tag at first from the Eustace first baseman. There's a fly ball to deep right, and that one's gonna go. Solo home run, Landon Mack. He did it again. Two homers, two nights. And he extends the Eustace lead by one hopping it off the warehouse and right. A great time for our audio to come back. It's 7 0. On the right field line, and Landon Mack extends the lead for Bishop Eustace to 7. His second home runs of the year. And now it's 7 0. For DWB Analytics, that is our 10th home run on a DWB broadcast this year in baseball. Estimated distance on that one 347 feet. Thanks to DWB Analytics. Want to know the count? Two balls, no strike. So now it's Trey Martin followed up by Dante Bell, although in this situation for Eustace, they might turn things around and put a couple reserves in. That one's down. That'll be a walk to Martin. And here's Dante Bell. There's Audubon's pitching coach, Wade Geis. Of course, Geis being a legendary last name in the Mountie from community. It looks like he changed his hair back recently because we saw him in one of the scrimmages and he had uh, bleached his hair. And it looks like it's, uh, unless it's just on the sides, I can't tell, but I don't know how long that bleached hair was for, but it was definitely a good look. I don't know why he got rid of it. That one's outside, 2-0. sentiments has gone pretty deep into their bullpen here. I mean, you know, look, this is a group two school that only really has so much in their resource tank. And in Anthony Melchior, the sophomore right-hander, number five, on the hill. That one's outside. Another four-pitch walk. That was actually Melchior's first high school appearance. 
So the first at bat he ever had at the varsity level was a home run. That's that's a gut punch right there. I mean, talk about a, you know, we talk about major leaguers giving up homers in their first start. That's like a welcome to the show moment right there. You know, a, a real humbling experience, to say the least. Now remember, Eustace, if they were to hit a three-run homer here with Sullivan, it would be a 10-0 game, but that does not mean the game would be over right away. Cinnaminson would get to bat in the bottom of the sixth, and that would determine if the game is over. Now, if it were the other way around and Eustace was the home team, as it wasn't last year, I mean, look, you know, you, this was the same scenario. Eustace was the visitor. Cinnaminson was scored as the home team. A one. Outside, both runners advance on a wild pitch. But if it were the other way, and the home team was up 10, then the game would be over as soon as they scored their 10th run, like a walk-off, if you will. But because Eustace is the visitor, if they were to get to that mark, it would be uh, an opportunity for Cinnamon to get some offense back on the board. That one skips off of the catcher's mask, takes a carom around home plate, and it's 2-1. and one. Just a rough situation for everybody. And now, mid at bat, Eric Teasdale is coming out. There is an, another arm, another lefty, warming up in the bullpen for Sentiminson. And that is number four, Dylan McAndrews. Another rookie who has not appeared at the varsity level yet. Kingsway has arrived. We're about an hour before scheduled first pitch of game two. And Audubon is standing right next to him and getting some work done. Some Audubon players, you can hear them actually behind me. They're in the uh, auxiliary gym hitting in the cages in there, those temporary cages that they have in the basketball court. So Kingsway's hitting outside, Audubon's hitting inside, and everybody's going to get ready to hit in about an hour. 2-1, ground ball. That one skips over the middle. That's going to be a base hit in the center field. Bell takes a hard turn around third. He will score. And it is 7-0. Actually, I'm sorry. Both runs came across there. It is now going to be 9-0. So Max Sullivan gets the two-run single. And the first pitch to the right fielder, Iannone, is 0-1. Two balls, one strike. Phillies and National are on right now for a Sunday afternoon edition in Washington. No score at the top of the second of that game. Line shot, right field side, that's a fair ball into the corner. Kulik's running over, that's gonna make it double digits. Or actually not yet, because Edwards, or uh, excuse me, Sullivan gets to third. And that's a double for Iannone into the field corner. They've still not hit that 10 mark yet. So a double for Iannone puts that 10th and 11th run in scoring position here. 
after the double. And now here is Anthony Keck. There's a ground ball up the middle. Harvey's got it. There's still nobody out, so the throw scooped to first is in time. And Eustace drives a run across. It is 10 0. Well, you were afraid that we were going to get here at some point, and now we're here. You know, Eustace and Cinnaminson had been playing off of each other really well for the first couple of innings. Cinnaminson's starter, Charlie Kind, did a great job of holding Cinnaminson, or rather, um, holding Eustace's lead to as little as possible, you know, giving up like a run on a single, a run on a sack fly. It was two nothing after three. But then a two spot, another two spot, and a four spot, and, you know, it shows that the offense in baseball is a lot of times exponential. It starts off slow and then it rapidly ramps up as soon as one thing goes wrong. It has a chain of events that end up turning the game on its head and bringing it out of reach. I mean, it's not Cinnaminson's fault. You know, you play this game nine times out of ten. You know, you play it a couple times over, you know, in a computer simulation or whatever, and Cinnaminson's going to win a couple of those times. Just tonight is not one of them. They say the runner was pulled off the bag, so Stinson gets an RBI single. And So Kay was able to score, or I'm sorry, um, Iannone was able to score. Back to the top of the order for Mishuli here in a five-run inning. The Mishuli brothers have been the only ones now to not grab a bat. Christian and Anthony. And now with one out, both of them, unless a double play happens, are guaranteed the bat. Mishuli fouls it. Two balls, one strike. Ground ball, Harvey's got it, shifting to the right. And they get the one out there, so they replace the runner. And Mashuli reaches first, there's two away. I mean, it's unfortunate, you know? Cinnaminson had a had a two-run deficit that just kind of spiraled out of control. And now this game is well out of hand when it very well could have been a lot closer if the circumstances were a little different. Cinnaminson will make another pitching change. So we've got a new lefty coming in. And again, this will be another player making his varsity debut. It is number four, Dylan McAndrews. We'll be right back after this. Back. 
All right, we had a we had a had to make a laptop for a, a battery switch, and then laptop crashed while we were in transition. So Bishop Eustace has batted around to seven runners, nothing. That's a base hit, left field. Mack gets to third. And that is a base hit by Eustace's number one, Brogan Burns. Yeah, it's 13 nothing. We missed a two-run single. Uh, like we said, our laptop shut off on us. Ground ball foul. Looks like Dante Bell is still hit. He is one for three. This is his fifth at bat of the night. Fly ball, shallow right. That is a foul ball. 0-2 oh with two outs. <laughs> Sentiments are looking to get out of the jam again. Ground ball out to Harvey. Flips it to second, and the inning is over. Bishop Eustace puts seven runs up, and this game has gotten into barn barter territory. 13 to nothing. Bottom of the sixth inning, it's the last stand for Cinnaminson. After an unraveled sixth inning, Bishop Eustace put up a seven spot. They lead 13 to nothing. 
in order for this game to continue into the seventh. Cinnaminson needs to put up four runs off of number 42 for the Bishop Eustis Crusaders. That is Jack Lero, who looks like barring a big turn of events, he'll be the closer here on this Sunday afternoon, game one. Inside. Jack Lero making his high school debut as a class of 27 freshman. Two balls, no strikes. Up high, 3 0. Cinnaminson's going to have the top of their order Harvey, Kulik, and McCluskey in the bottom of the sixth. Strike two, or strike one, rather. Three one. It's a little hard to see the scoreboard with the glare. Popped up. First base side. Landed Mack goes over. And he made the catch, but that's not going to count because it was out of play. That was kind of impressive. He made the catch behind the cinnamons and dugout and right next to where they were cooking hamburgers. But because it there's a couple of orange traffic cones that set the field of boundaries. So any like you can't go into the street and make the catch and have it count. It's not major league baseball. Like they have to it has to stay in the boundaries in order for the catch to count. Is what is what I've been told. That is ball four to Harvey. started a couple minutes late at around 12.10, so we'd be sitting at two hours and 10 minutes for this game one. There's a rocket deep left field by Mike Kulik. And it's gonna one hop off the wall. That one looked like a goner, but instead it's gonna be a double and Harvey holds it third. I was gonna say, hold the homers to Matt McCloskey. Speaking of, guess who's that? Matt McCloskey. Four career high school homers, three last year, one this year on opening day versus Bordentown. By the way, an out-of-town score update. Triton fell to Cherry Hill West 12-0 in the first round of the Camden County Tournament this morning at Rutgers Camden. That one misses. That's a ground ball out to short. It's bobbled, and that's going to be an error against Eustace's new shortstop. Or actually, no, Anthony Mischuli. So he's been there all night, but he picks up an error. And an RBI, it's 13-1.
Harvey scores, Kulik to third, and that puts runners on the corners here. I mean, hey, it's not a tying run, but the game-saving run to send this game into the seventh is still there. And he's at the plate, and it's Allison Droney. So don't count these guys out yet. They are not waving the white flag. As here's a fly ball deep out towards left. Stinson going in. He overstepped a little bit. It'll be a sack fly. Sliding and scoring as Kulik. It's 13 to 2. So even though this game may have been out of hand for a while, we're now starting to see a little bit of fight from Cinnamon. And it's not that they didn't have to fight before. I'll just, I'll, I'll lead with that. I'll preface it with that. They have had the fight all day. They just were overpowered, as they were last year. Same song, second verse. But that's the first out of the inning. McCloskey's on first. And now Gideon Crisp, who is 0 for 2, takes a strike, 0 1. Only five games being played today in all of South Jersey. And in fact, all of New Jersey. Haddonfield is heading up north to playing uh, to play Watchung Hills. And actually the final score of that game, Watchung Hills 11, Haddonfield 1. Cherry Hill East in Collingswood is getting ready to start in about a half hour. But then we have this game, we have Kingsway and Audubon. I mean, that, those are the only five games that are being played in the entire state. Triton and Cherry Hill West, that's done. Haddonfield and Watching Hills, that's two. Eustace and Cinnamon, that's about to be three. Audubon and Kingsway, four, and then Cherry Hill East and Collingswood, five. So all five games being played in the entire state have something to do with South Jersey. Here's a fly ball to center field going back. A nice catch by Mascholi to bring that one in, and McCloskey will retreat to first. And we've got the last call here. For Hamill. Now he is the game saving run. Remember, they can't just get it 13 and three. They need both McCloskey and another run to score in order for this game to progress to the seventh inning. But with the way that this progress is, Kingsway and Audubon, considering this game doesn't affect them and they don't have to rely on either of these other teams winning or losing, all you have to worry about is time. And these guys are, are loose. They're stretching on the third base line. Kingsway's on the first base line. They're almost ready to play. It's 225, and they don't care how this game ends. It doesn't affect them. They're only worried about the game ahead, and they want to get it started when they can. And if you can start it ahead of schedule, that's even better. That one misses. Cinnamons, and after a dominant 7-0 win over Bordentown on Monday, would now fall to 1-2 and two on the campaign after a fourth-place finish in the Ralph Shaw. Bishop Eustace would improve to one and one. As we said, Eustace plays Paul sixth on Wednesday. That was a game we were going to cover, but I think we're going to switch it around and we'll have Wednesday as an off day and Tuesday will probably be that Absagami game at four o'clock versus Lower Cape May in some Cape Atlantic League action. There's a strike. We're down to the last call. Two balls, two strikes, two outs. In an 11 run game, Matt McCloskey on first. Gideon Crisp trying to keep this game alive versus Eustace's freshman Jack Laro. Here we go. Two balls, two strikes, and the pitch. Outside. 3 2. Let's stay alive. And don't forget for the Kingsway Audubon game, make sure to follow the appropriate link on YouTube. It has already been posted on our channel for game two. Here's the pitch. High and away, and we stay alive. Ball four to Chris. Or excuse me, to Hamill. Now here's Tim Morell. Two runners on, two outs, and I mean, hey. Morell has a strikeout and a hit by pitch. He's gotten on base tonight. He's barreled up the ball a couple of times on a couple of fouls, but you just get a knock and 
you send this game to the seventh inning and we start all over again. They just need the two runs. It doesn't need to be 13 to 12. It just has to be 13 to four. That's the minimum. And obviously Eustace, I think everybody except for Cinnamons and, you know, kind of wants this game to end in the sixth, but that's going to be a stolen base, a double steal, although you'll probably end up scoring that as defensive indifference because Sullivan nor Mashuli even moved from their positions at second and short. So, But that's one of those gray area rules that sometimes gets scored and sometimes doesn't and many times doesn't get scored correctly. There's a ground ball. This will do it. Throw to first, scooped in time. And that's the ball game. Bishop Eustace captures the bronze medal for the second year in a row, not in the form of a perfect game, but in a six inning mercy rule. The final score, Bishop Eustace 13, Cinnamons in two. After a 7-0 win on Monday, Cinnamonson drops both games in the Ralph Shaw, losing by six yesterday and 11 today. Obviously, the performances from last year were a little bit better for the Pirates, but for Eric Teasdale, you know, he's going to look back at this, and he gets to face Group 4 champion Seneca. I'm sorry, Group 2 champion Seneca, the team that beat Haddon Heights for the sectional title last year. They get to face a state semifinalist next Tuesday on the 9th. From everybody here at Dan Wilkins Broadcasting, we've still got one more game to play and about 30 minutes left to wait. Our entire crew, Anthony De Palma, our social media manager, our graphics coordinator and uh, crew, Gavin Van Rell, Caleb Lane, and Liam Nolan, my producer, Jacob Steidler. I'm Dan Wilkins. We'll see you in a half hour with Audubon and Kingsway. See you guys soon.